Praise the Lord. It's good to be here in the presence of the Lord and in fellowship with you. Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight I want to share something that the Lord has been quickening to my own heart. There are a few in the congregation who've had heard me share on it already. I trust that they'll not be bored. I'd like to share something that I feel the Lord dropped into my spirit while ministering in South America during the months of February and March of this year, and uh, it is this, bitternesses, why do they come, and how can we be free of them? Bitterness. How does it come? Why does it come? And how can I be free of it? Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, I'd like to make a confession to you. This is a chapter that has greatly blessed my life, and yet for many years, I felt it was totally disjointed, very poorly put together. Now that's a terrible thing to say about the Holy Spirit, isn't it? And yet we understand that He's not at fault, but until He enlightens our spirits, until he enlightens our hearts in his word, sheds revelation upon it, uh, much of his word looks that way to us. Because the natural man does not understand the things of God. And I'm glad that's so, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Amen. But as God began to open this chapter to me, I began to realize it was very well correlated very well related. It was not disjointed, but there was something very precious in it for my life. Hallelujah. Amen. And I would like to say this before we start to read, that I think we're all aware that when the Lord spoke, He did not speak by chapters and verses. And uh, this is one of those spots where I feel, since I feel the Lord has begun to open this to me, that uh, those wonderful students of the Word, scholars who uh, divided into chapters and verses for us so that uh, we could more easily read the Scriptures with some better measure of understanding of them, uh, I think the division would have been better somewhere else. I realize had they not put a division here, it would have made chapter 11 to have been quite lengthy. But it's very difficult and impossible to understand the setting of chapter 12 unless you back up to chapter 11. Praise the Lord. Amen. Shall we just read beginning with verse 1? Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied in your minds, or lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, 
Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, for of all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which have corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without, which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you tonight that we're privileged to be in your presence. We're privileged to gather together on such an occasion as this, bringing, Lord, ourselves together in the company, gathering together unto the Lord to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We thank you for precious truths that have already been revealed and made real and quickened and confirmed Lord, in our hearts and our lives. Now we ask tonight for your anointing. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon us. Grant that we might speak as your oracle, for you have thus commanded it to be so, that if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. But we would ask, Lord, that you would open our ears, that we might hear the thing that the Spirit of God would speak to us and give us a disposition of heart that we might carry through to know your blessing and your deliverance and your working and leading in our lives. With regard to your word to us tonight, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. The chapter starts out with the word, wherefore. Hallelujah. And that says we need to back up. He's been speaking to something previously. And uh, he has, uh, what he is now about to say has been prefaced by something that is related or, or has bearing on the thing that he is now endeavoring to convey unto us. And he begins talking about a cloud of witnesses. I don't know what your interpretation is about a cloud of witnesses. I'd like to suggest to you that I believe he's talking about all of those saints that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Together with all of those other many saints that have joined them since that time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I believe that 
Uh, he's referring to a grandstand situation where there's a multitude of men and women who are beholding us as we presently stand before the Lord. Hallelujah. And uh, I like to think of them as cheering us on. Though we may not be aware of them, yet uh, he calls our attention to them that we might be made aware of them. That they as secret beholders are watching us. It isn't only that God has his eye upon us, but they too have their eye upon us. Now, let me say this to you. I don't know what your theology is. But just let me make a bold statement. I don't believe in soul sleep. The Apostle Paul makes it very, very clear. To be absent from the body is to be where? Thank the Lord. And I believe that. And again, I don't know where your theology is, but... Uh, I'd like to say this. Uh, just recently someone shared with me about someone that's teaching that all the Old Testament saints are spiritually dead. Then how in the world did Moses and Elijah make the Mount of Transfiguration? They were there. I don't know who he was, but how did that fellow whom John fell down to worship say to him, See that thou do it not, for I am one of thy brethren. I don't call angels brothers. You said, Brother Beach, I don't understand that, neither do I. That's part of the beauty of going to heaven. There'll be a lot of things that I haven't understood. Hallelujah. That I'll be able to understand. Praise the Lord. Amen. But in light of that great company of saints, we refer to them as heroes of faith. The writer to the Hebrew says, Wherefore? Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run. They've run. They're winners. And yet, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, God having Provided some better thing for them. Good. You're awake. God having provided some better thing for us. That they without us. Should not be made perfect. Praise the Lord. Amen. In light of this fact, we're exhorted to run with patience. And Bible commentators would say to you that that word patience doesn't really mean patience in the sense that we know it. But actually, rather, let us run the race with endurance. Now, I don't like that word endure. Because I don't see why God can't do some quickies. Why should I have to endure? After all, the Lord that I serve is big and powerful. We sang tonight that he established the earth and, and he's established heaven and all of those wonderful things. Why do I have to endure? Well, there's no problem with him. But it's fitting me, preparing me for the thing that he has for me. That's why I have to endure. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. But you see, we need to do something in order to do that. We need to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. He's saying there is the possibility of certain encumbrances, of certain hindrances of your being your dead level best. And you need to look after those matters. Looking unto Jesus. Do you know of any place else to look tonight? Brethren, I know of no other place to look except to look to Jesus. Hallelujah. You know why? He started this whole thing. Hallelujah. It wasn't your idea, neither was it mine. Hallelujah. We did not design the beginning. Neither have we figured out the ending of it. He is the author. He is the finisher of faith. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He is the author. He is the finisher of faith. Glory. Now it says concerning him that for the joy that was set before him, he endured something. And he despised something. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. For consider him. Take a good look. Don't get, don't just get uh, emotional. Uh, to the point of becoming visionary and you're back, you know, on Good Friday and you see that awful, awful bloody scene. I'm not belittling it. I'm not trying to play it down. But that's about all the considering that some of us do. Thank God we have Holy Week every week or some folk would never consider But he's talking about some other kind of considering. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. God, by the Holy Ghost, is setting the stage for us to come up to something. He is saying to us, I want you to understand, take a good look at the author, take a good look at the finisher, and not just a good look, but the thought is continuity, looking, ever looking. Constantly beholding Jesus, the author, the finisher of faith. Hallelujah. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood. Striving against sin. That awful, awful, awful night. That in the garden of Gethsemane.
in agony of soul and spirit. His body even came under that awful agony. And the scripture says he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Striving against sin. Enduring contradiction of sinners against himself. And then wouldn't you know it, right when I'm all keyed up and about ready to have a good cry about Gethsemane and Calvary, he says to me, and my son, forget not that certain admonition that came. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. And I say, oh God, you don't make Russian salad? What in the world is going on? But then I began to see something. I heard the Lord saying to me, as he began to quicken this word to my heart, Son, I want you to receive every contrary thing that touches your life as part of my discipline, as part of my chastisement in your life. Everything, Lord? You mean those hard, nasty things? You mean those unwanted, unsought for things? You mean those barbs that people give you when they're talking to you? And those barbs that you hear they say about you that are even worse when they're not talking to your face, but they're talking behind your back? You mean when somebody gets mad and tells me off? Yes. He said, even those things. I want you to begin to reach out and embrace them and see them as part of my dealing, my discipline, my chastisement in your life. And then I understood a little bit better. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And there are some, of course, who say, now wait a minute, brother. You know, in everything, yes, but for everything, no. But the same Apostle and the same Holy Spirit who got the thing together and said, in everything give thanks, over in another place said, in and for everything. That includes brothers-in-law. Do you think the two of us could ever live together for almost 30 years if we hadn't have come to a little bit of that? God's been gracious to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But Brother Veach, I'm not that bad that I have to be chasing that long and that often. We don't understand.
I want to believe very much that God's discipline and God's correction is not discipline of acts or deeds necessarily, but it is the correction and the discipline of character. It's not just because he caught me with my hand in the cookie jar that he begins to chastise me, but he chastises me because he knows there's a bent in my nature that will go to the cookie jar the moment Baba steps out of the room. And he says, I'm after that thing in you. I want to bring a dealing in your life. There's something very beautiful. If we can come to this, where we can begin to receive everything that comes our way, not just nice things. Do you know why we're prone to be proud and bigoted and big-headed? It's because we receive only nice things and we reject anything that is contrary toward us. But if I can learn under God by examining the Scripture, by seeing what those dear old saints went through to get where they did, and by looking at our wonderful Lord and understanding the discipline of God in His life, you say, Brother, what did you say? I can't accept that. Jesus was the Son of God. Of course He was. But the Word says He learned obedience. And let me suggest that obedience is not automatic. Not even in the life of our Lord was it automatic. He said, oh, you just destroyed my Jesus. No. He was touched with humanity. For we have not a high priest that might be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But we have one who was tempted at all points, like as we, yet without sin. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! What are we going to do with Romans where it says it pleased him to make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering? Oh, oh, does that ever knock my theology in the head? Please don't misunderstand me tonight. But most of us Live with the concept of Jesus, of a little miracle baby that was born. And he did miracles on the first day that he was born and kept on doing them and still is. Sorry to disappoint you. It took him 33 years to come to miracles. You say, why? Because he was under the dealings of the Father. He was under the leadership of his Father. And there he was. Attached to a very natural down-to-earth thing. Allowed to be reared by a carpenter. Working together with Joseph. 
his earthly guardian as a carpenter. And only when he was 33 years of age is there any talk of miracles in his life. For consider him who endured You think you've got it tough? Go back and reflect on the life of Jesus. Now, if you you and I know that the moment he was born, he should have been born talking. After all, he made the tongue, he made the ear, he should have been born talking, prophesying. He should have come out of the womb, prophesying. The Son of God! has made his arrival. Hallelujah. But no, he went through the toilsome process that we all go through. He was limited. He was restricted. He was curtailed. He was disciplined by a loving father. Hallelujah. And that's why I need to look at him And when I begin to consider who he is, was, and ever shall be, and realize the process that the Father allowed him to go through, there's no room for being weary nor fainting in my mind. Hallelujah. When I think of the little things I go through. But I'm greatly encouraged. I'm greatly strengthened in God. Praise the Lord. So I want to believe that while we as parents and men disciplined to cure, in a true sense our Lord does too. And yet, I would like to suggest that he's more curative than he, or more preventative than he is curative. It is not so much a dealing with actions Not so much a dealing with deeds as it is dealing with motive, dealing with desire, dealing with character that's already twisted and marred by sin. And lots of times we get discouraged. You say, well, Lord, what did I do wrong now? It isn't that you did anything wrong, it's just that you are wrong. And he's after making us right. Not right in ourselves, but right by his grace. Right by his redemptive work in us. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Remember a little incident, Sister Veets will remember it very well also. I'll not share with you the country lest some of you present might discern who we might be speaking of. But in one of the countries where we served as missionaries, we quite often traveled together with another missionary couple to get to conventions and fellowship meetings. And uh, their little boy was, he never liked to travel. Somehow when he'd begin to travel, he would get fretty and disturbed and Almost invariably, this servant of the Lord would stop the car and haul him out and work him over and slam him back in the seat and then we'd have a peaceful journey there and back, uh, whatever the occasion was. And one day we had gotten into the car and started easing out of the driveway when all of a sudden the brother hit the brakes and And turned off the ignition, opened the door, jumped out, reached in the back seat, grabbed the kid by the arm, pulled him out, and whaled the stuffings out of him. And his wife's eyes got like teacups. You know, and I thought she was going to cry. And finally she said, what did you do that for? 
He said, well, it seems that it's become customary. Every time we go for a trip, he ends up with a lick, and I thought we'd give him one before it started. We'd not wait until he was bad. We'd lick him first. Now, I don't think exactly that's what the Lord has in mind with us. But I do know that he's correcting us. Furthermore, he says we're not to despise those corrections. How do we look at those everyday people situations in our lives? I don't know about you, but if it wasn't for people, I and the Lord could get along all right. I think we got a good thing going until I meet Carlton Spencer or somebody else like him. Hallelujah. <laughs> You are, brother. Oh, indeed you are. Hallelujah. I haven't heard you make the other confession, and I'm not asking you to, but I marvel if you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think we have known something of what the Word of God is saying to us. If ye endure not chastening, then God dealeth with you as with bastards. And I don't mean it to be unkind. But we need to look at it for what it is. And I'm afraid that to a great extent our Dr. Spock generation has been a bastard generation. And our hearts are broken. We have reaped a whirlwind. And we don't know what to do with it. If we endure chastening, and again we come back to that word endure. And the thing that bothers me about it is it sounds so long. Endure. You know. Hallelujah. I've got it made. And I used to talk about having my one-way ticket to heaven. And then I found that verse that said, He that believeth and... How long? No wonder I heard Bob Mumford say one time, if it, if it was getting us the glory that all God wanted, he ought to have one evangelist preaching the word, and the moment they say, I believe, have another one with a gun that shoots them. <laughs> but you see, there's something in the enduring that God is working in us. I wonder if we can find out what it is. He says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits 
and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit. And here's the why. That we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, I don't like that. I'll tell you the one I like. It's found over in Peter, and it says something like this. Whereby there are left unto us exceeding great and precious promises, whereby we're made partakers of the divine nature. That's my favorite verse. Hallelujah, get a promise, hang on to it, glory to God, make me holy, Jesus. But he's actually saying to us here, if you really want to be partakers of my holiness, there is a particular part of my holiness that the only way you can ever get it is in the woodshed. Go back and read it. They corrected us. For what purpose? After their own pleasure. Boy, the Holy Ghost gets pretty personal, doesn't it? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I wonder how many kids are here tonight. That could raise their hands and remember the times when dad was frustrated at mom or mom was frustrated at the teacher or the neighbor and you just happened to come on the scene at the right time and whammo, you got it. And you went to your room bawling, thinking, boy, what did I do now? What was that all about? Of course, we'll not ask for a showing of hands of the parents either on that one. But I see some head nod- heads nodding. I think we can identify, can't we? But he never did it for pleasure to us. He never exposes us to a people situation that brings his discipline into our lives just for pure joy or pleasure. But he knows that it's the only way that we can be partakers of his holiness. Let me reword that. He has made unto us holiness. But he knows that there is a certain aspect of his holiness that can come to us only as we are disciplined by him. People situation. Mother and dad situations, husband situation, wife situation, neighbor situation, a brother situation, a sister situation, a student, a teacher situation, a pastor, a deacon situation. An elder, a deacon situation. Oh, we can think of them. An employer, an employee situation. I can get all excited and say, Devil, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I take authority over this thing. Yeah, fine, go ahead. 
But if God's after something in you, that isn't going to change it. Or if it does, God in His great mercy and grace may honor your faith, your sincerity, but expose you to a worse situation a little later on. How do I react? How do I receive those people situations? Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And how true it is, regardless of how slight or how light or how small or insignificant that moment of discipline is, there is no joy in it at the moment. It's not an occasion for shouting, but rather for grief. But afterward, it yieldeth. Huh? Peaceable fruit unto righteousness, unto them that are exercised thereby. And he uses this word wherefore again. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. In other words, he say, stop moping around. Get with it. Come on. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop going around with Grandma Mule's face. And begin to enjoy. Get those hands that have been hanging. Get them up. Get them working. Those knees that have been so uncertain. Come on, get them going. Hallelujah. Make straight paths for your feet. Because there's some really some weak ones that are following behind you. Weak in the faith. And if you don't get yourself in hand and get straightened out, you're going to cause those lame ones to be turned aside. They'll go into apostasy. They'll get messed up. They'll be all confused if you don't walk the line. So snap out of it. Get with it. Begin to take it for what it's worth. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But let it rather be healed. You see, if you and I will take the things that are happening to us daily in the right way, little lambs, that are round about us and following us who are yet not strong enough to mark out paths for themselves, they'll be strengthened, they'll be healed. If you and I will toe the line, if you and I will be submissive to God's discipline, to God's dealing in our lives, they'll be strengthened, they'll be ministered, they'll be lifed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And look at this. Here's another one of those verses. Just dropped right down in the middle of the thing and you say, what in the world is he talking about? What in the world does it all mean? And he simply is saying here, follow peace with all men. You know what I believe he's saying? He's saying, look, 
you had better be at peace with that people situation that I've allowed to develop in your life. You'd better be at peace with Bill Smith who's just told you off and told you what a failure and what a misfit you were to the kingdom who harshly judged you miss or rightly God knows but you'd better follow peace with him or her hallelujah be at peace with all men and holiness that discipline that correction You'd better have on that holiness that comes through God's dealing in your life. For without such, no man can see the Lord. And you know something? How true it is. To them that are pure, all things are pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And when your heart is pure, you see God where other folks are seeing the devil. Because your heart's pure. Oh, don't misunderstand. The adversary of the devil is real. He's not a hoax. Though he's a fake. He's a thief. He's a murderer. He's a liar. According to the word of God. But we're not trying to say to you tonight, pretend that the devil doesn't exist. No. But when your heart is pure, you can see God. Where other folk don't see him. And you can't see God without holiness. You can't see God without being made a partaker of his holiness either. And the more we see of his holiness the more we realize our own unholiness. And he's saying to us, if you learn to embrace these things that are coming your way and receive them as my loving hand of correction and discipline, and you'll be at peace with those individuals that I allow to bring it your way. Hallelujah. Let's go on. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. I was ministering in northern Argentina and I was reading from the Spanish Bible and God began to unfold this to me and I saw something. In the Spanish Bible it says, and I'm going to say it to you in Spanish, we've got some folk here who are, 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 are real masters in Spanish. Mirando para que ninguno deja de alcanzar la gracia de Dios. Looking diligently lest someone should cease to reach. 
Not that someone should be unable to reach, but that someone should cease to reach or leave off reaching the grace of God. And I began to understand something. For years I looked at that verse and of course I, you know, that was a good strong one to prove to you that you're not once in grace, always in grace. You do backslide. There's a danger at least that it could happen. And of course even when we follow through the thought that we're bringing tonight, it ultimately ends in that. But I began to see something else. Immediately the Holy Spirit brought to my mind when Paul three times earnestly sought the Lord that he'd be delivered from the thorn in his flesh. I don't know what it was. We've heard all kinds of ideas as to what Paul's thorn might have been. Your idea is good as mine, perhaps. Or mine as good as yours. But God said to him, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. And God is wanting to say to us in this hour, in our daily living, in our daily circumstances, in our daily people situations, George, Tom, Susie, Jean, whoever, my grace is sufficient for thee. You don't have to let that thing get the best of you. I've got enough grace to see you through that situation, ugly as it might be. Thank God. Looking diligently lest any man should cease to avail himself of grace for his situation or circumstance. And I'd like to point out to you some steps of deterioration as I see them here in this word. When I am buffeted, when I am contradicted, when I am hurt, I can do one of two things with it. I can thank the Lord for it, embrace it, and reach out and make a demand on his all-sufficient grace to carry me through if the right spirit and attitude in that situation. Or I can allow something to begin to deteriorate within me. And the first thing you know, I'm hurt. I'm feeling sorry for myself. Huh? Lest there be any root of bitterness springing up whereby many are defiled. I can let that husband situation, that wife situation, that child situation, that work situation, whatever situation it is, I can allow that thing, we can allow that thing to become bitterness. And when you and I cease to avail ourselves of heaven's grace in that situation, we're on the road to bitterness. We're on the road to bitterness. The moment we cease to lay hold upon heaven's grace in our situation.
Bitterness is like an epidemic. It spreads. One of the prophecies that came over my wife and I right after we were married, that we would be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the old waste places. And for many years, God has related us To some real yucky church situations. Split churches over doctrine. Split churches because the preacher had gone immoral and had to be dismissed. Where there were rank, hard feelings. Where one elder sat on that side and the other elder sat on that side and never the twain should meet. And I have watched a whole assembly passed through the epidemic of bitterness. It spreads and eats like a canker. I have watched families deteriorate where one member of the family has become bitter over a given situation in his or her life. I've seen it affect every child as they were born into the family. It was like putting a brand, like putting a mark on them. All were tainted by it. How sad it is. But he uses another lest, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. And I'd like to suggest something to you tonight, and it's this. Your refusal to submit to everyday disappointments in life as being something from God that He has allowed to touch your life so as to shape and to mold you and to conform you to His image will ultimately produce bitterness in your spirit. And that bitterness will spread You'll not be the only person affected by it. Did you ever know of someone in the congregation getting mad and just that one person leaving the church? Seldom ever. They usually walk out with a crowd. And if the crowd doesn't walk out with them, the crowd usually follows them within a few days, a few weeks. One of the churches I pastored, we had a lovely family. As a matter of fact, I feel certain they were looked upon as one of the most well-adjusted families of our assembly. When I was in Spain, God gave me a dream. And in the dream I realized that this family had a problem. 
somewhere. I don't think even yet they really know. But somewhere bitterness got into that family. When I finally sat down and tried to counsel with them, the wife broke down and wept. And she said, Brother Veach, all of my life I have been married. Of course, I knew that was an excuse. She argued that she had no one, yet in the dream God showed me, showed me her with a man. There was nothing in the natural that you could have picked it up. Matter of fact, he was our Sunday school superintendent. She sang solos in the local church. They blessed us. Had it not been that the Holy Spirit alerted me by the dream, it was a crazy dream. And when I woke up and sat up in bed in Madrid, Spain, I said, oh, this is crazy. What in the world did I eat before I went to bed? And the Lord spoke and said, no, you didn't eat anything, son. There's a problem there. I want you to pray. And I began to pray. I'd been back home in the church two weeks. The Sunday school superintendent walked into my office after the devotional to begin Sunday school on Sunday morning. He said, Pastor, I've got a problem. I said, yes, you've got a problem with your wife. He said, how did you know? I told him the dream. He said, I can't accept it. No way. Suffice it to say that in spite of our praying, in spite of our warning, in spite of our counseling, in spite of our urging them to seek further counsel, professional counsel, they ended up blindly in a divorce. She was divorced six months, and that little woman who was tired of being married all of her life, you guessed it, she married again. But here's what I want to share. Every last member of that family has been affected adversely by that thing. That bitterness went through them like a plague. The daughters who were so consecrated and, and, and so beautifully walking with God, young girls, became worldly, got involved in, in deep sin. And not even the Sunday school superintendent was able to hold his own before it was over with. I'd like to suggest that bitterness will ultimately lead to immorality and uncleanness. And when immorality and uncleanness comes into our lives, if there's not a genuine repentance, we will deny our birthright. The blessings that once were sacred and precious and we held them as something dear in our lives, we'll deny them. But I want to say to you, it need not be so. You say, Brother Beach, how can we avoid this? I believe it's very simple. I believe if we will go back to that thing that has happened and don't whitewash it and try to pretend that it's, it, it wasn't there, and I don't mean to be unkind with this, but a statement was made in, in public in a, in, a, in a charismatic gathering and it disturbed me. Someone said, uh, if you've got a bitterness, it, it, you can be healed by going back and pretending that it didn't happen. I want you to know that that isn't what grace is for. Grace is not for pretense. Grace is for realism. Grace is to be able to face up to the problem, face up to the situation, nasty as it is, unpleasant as it is, face it. And while you're looking at it, realize that there is 
an abundant supply of heaven's grace that is fitted for you for that situation. Begin to reach out and embrace that thing and say, Lord, I want to thank you. You say, Brother Veach, are you for real? Yes, let me share something with you briefly in closing before we pray. That I experienced in my own heart and life. I lost my dad when I was three years of age. He was a young preacher. He died at the early age of 29. There were five of us, four boys and a girl. Three years later, my mother married a man whose wife had died and left him with three girls and two boys. After a few years, mom and dad produced six of their own. We knew the reality of come quick, your kids and my kids are beating the life out of our kids. It was no joke. I never realized it, but when I was at Elam at Hornell, in my second year of Bible school, it was during the days of great heart searchings of the latter rain revival. God was meeting with us, dealing with our hearts. I'll never forget when in the, in the lecture hall of old Hornell, he backed me into a corner and he said, Son, I want to touch bitterness in your life. And I, I wanted to argue. I said, God, me bitter? I'm not bitter. Why am I bitter? Lord, I'm not bitter. He said, why is it every now and then you throw into my face, Oh God, if my dad had lived, it wouldn't be this way. And all of a sudden my mind began to go back to those many, 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 almost numberless moments of upbringing when that attitude was there. Those words were formed, if not on my lips, they were down in here and they were up here. Boy, it wouldn't be like this if my daddy had lived. And then he reminded me a few times that I even said, God, why? Why did you do it? Why did you allow it? The nonsense of it. My daddy's a preacher and look at this stepfather I've got. He's a beast. And yet, let me say in all due respect to him, he was a great man. He just never knew. He never learned how to love. He was moral. He was a hard-working man. He just never knew how to love. And if there's anything that an orphan kid needs, it's love. I was starved to death of it. And if my mother sought to give us some, poor dad was so hard up, hard fixed that he'd get jealous of the relationship. So that even as a boy coming up, as a little kid, I seldom knew after mother remarried what it was to have my own mother embrace me. I never knew what it was ever. I don't ever recall. In, in the years that I lived at home, seeing my stepfather take my mother in his arms and love her, embrace her, kiss her. Don't ever recall having seen that happen. There were gestures. I'm sure in his thinking there were gestures of love. But to me, they spelled something else. And they made me cringe. And for the first time in my life that day as I wept in the old lecture hall at Hornell, I was able to say, Father, I want to thank you. When I was three years of age, you saw fit not just to call my father unto yourself, but to leave me an orphan.
and the pang, the memory pain that I had known for years was healed. when I was able to face the thing and realize that there was a sufficiency of his great grace to cover me in that area. I believe he can do the same for hearts that may be going through great bitterness. And let me say this, I I think it only fair to say this, Men are particularly tempted to bitterness. You know where it is? It's in our marriage. Husbands, be not bitter toward them. Your situation tonight may not be a married situation. It may not be any of the situations that I've even touched on or named. But if you're here and you know that the Word of God has uncovered something to you, I want to assure you tonight you can be set free from that bitterness. You can be released from it. I've talked with men who've been bitter because they felt they married the wrong girl. Talk with wives who are bitter because they feel that their husband does not spend enough time with them. Talk with husbands who feel that the wife lavishes more affection upon the children than she does on him. Talk to people who are bitter because on the job they got bumped. They really deserve the promotion. Someone else got it. It could be any number of things. But they're real. They're real. And if not dealt with in God, can bring us to a place of immorality. And not necessarily immorality in the sense of a sexual sin. For fornication is very broad in the term when it's used in Scripture. It does not specifically say that Esau committed sexual sin, although he did. Upon hearing the admonition to Jacob by his father and his mother that he was not to take of any of the women of the nations round about them, but he was to go back to Laban's house and there find a wife. When Esau heard this, he got up and went out and took unto himself of some of the ites, and they became his wives in open rebellion to his mother and to his father's admonition. Some of the immorality that's gone on in the lives of some of God's people. They say, I don't know how it happened. It never intended. Maybe if you're here tonight, you might trace the thing back. And find out because there was a little situation that you became bitter over and never let God heal you of it. You never faced up to it in God's grace. And you let that situation deteriorate in your life until it robbed you not only of victory and joy and blessing, but finally you fell into sexual sin. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. I believe you can be released tonight from that bitterness by simply in faith acknowledging it, confessing it, 
asking his forgiveness, seeking his cleansing, embracing that thing, thanking him for it, and beginning to avail yourself of heaven's grace for daily living. Shall we stand? If God has been speaking to your heart tonight and you know there's a situation in your life that has been touched, I invite you to come. Not going to prolong the invitation, not going to beg people to come, but if you're here and you know that God is saying something to your heart in light of his word tonight, I just invite you to come. Let's stand here together. We're going to pray together in just a few moments. Praise the Lord. Anyone, you know that there's something in your life that God has touched tonight. I invite you to come. Just move out. And let's just come and stand here in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. To obey the Lord, obey the Holy Spirit. Some may be fearful. Some may say, Brother Veach, it would be terribly hard for me to open up and just pour out. I don't want you to. Let, let me share something with you that I just felt God has given me for this. I know about a woman who was bitter in her spirit. Her reason, no doubt, was different than what any of the reasons that may be represented here tonight. She was childless. She became bitter. Her name was Hannah. But she brought her bitterness to God. And one day the priest of the Lord found her in the temple... She wasn't making any sound. Her lips were just moving. And he reprimanded her because he thought, sure, she was drunk. She'd had too much wine. And I'd like to suggest to you tonight, it's very feasible. There might be situations present here that you wouldn't even want to utter them out loud. If that be so, let your lips move. But tell it to the Lord. Talk to him about it. Let him meet you. Because she opened her heart to the Lord about it, she went back home. You know the story. According to the time of life, Hannah brought forth a son and she called him Samuel. And she lent him to the Lord. And it was said of that man of God that the Lord did not allow one of his words to fall to the ground. Because a woman knew enough to bring her bitterness into the presence of God. And to talk to him about it. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But let God talk to you tonight. Let's believe God together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.